Hello, I'm V.B. Price, editor of the New Mexico Mercury. Uh, I'm here today with Mexican-American journalist Alfredo Corchado, who has covered crime and drug cartels and their infiltration of national and local governments in Mexico since 1994 uh, as a foreign correspondent for the Dallas Morning News. His new book is Midnight in Mexico, a reporter's journey through a country's descent into darkness. Welcome to the New Mexico Mercury. It's wonderful to have you with us. Maybe it's my it's my pleasure to be here, and and I think just walking here, I feel like it's a writer's paradise, and I'm ready to just say goodbye to this tour and go and I, and I'm, I think I'm inspired writing another book now. <laughs> wonderful! It's, it's, That's a, great. it's a great great setting. That's great. Since Mexico is um, North America's most important neighbor, with vast influence on life in the United States, as you've written. What role do you think the U.S. plays in the disaster of the Mexican drug war? Uh, in what respects and to what degree are we, north of the border, culpable for the terrible maiming of Mexico and 100,000 people plus who have already died? I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, uh, I, I challenge anyone to think of another country that impacts the United States more on a daily basis, more than, than Mexico, and vice versa obviously, uh, whether it's uh, blood ties, trade, uh, food, culture. I mean, it's Mexico and the United States. So it's a natural impact. And, and it's, a, it's a question I think a lot of Mexicans think a lot about. You know, As you said, more than 100,000 people have either been killed or kid, uh, disappeared since 2006. It's a, it's a stain that, that, that's been left on Mexico. And I think for a lot of people it's been clear that, that 40 years of, of this policy really hasn't worked for either side. Um, but as a journalist, I think, you know, I've been in Mexico for 20 years for the Dallas Morning News. And to me, one of the most interesting things that I've seen is how Mexicans are still blaming the United States for a lot of things. But they're also shaming their own authorities Ooh. for their incompetence, for their indifference, Ooh. for looking the other way. And it's, you know, as, as one person told me recently in, in, in Chihuahua, we don't want to be victims anymore. We don't want to feel like we're victims. We want to take back our country. And I think that, for anyone, gives, gives, it, gives us a, a sense of hope yes. that Mexico is in a transition. And Mexico is changing and it's moving, and I, I try to capture that, in in this book, you know that uh, you, the United States will always have its demand. There will always be guns going south, but I think the Mexicans also want to be able to, to build a country of laws, that laws that work, a rule of law, and you know, often people say. Well, why don't you just get out of Mexico? And it, for me, it's, yes, it's a, it's been a frightening time as a journalist, but I think it's also been a fascinating time oh, to, to watch this transition. So the drug war policy of 40 years, uh, what, would, what would happen if suddenly uh, the United States legalized drugs? Would that have a major impact on, on the drug war in Mexico? I mean, the, the, really the people who have held Mexico hostage for so long, uh, before and during the drug war, um, it's really a group of farmers out of Sinaloa. I mean, that's really how this whole thing started. Wow. People who saw a demand in the United States and, you know, they were going to meet that demand. So I think if if the U.S. was to legalize, um, the, the organized crime uh, leaders would just go on to something else. At the end of the, uh, of the day, it's really about organized crime it's about contraband, and it's about a weak rule of law. Um, okay. I, I, I'm not trying to be flippant or funny, oh, but I no. often think, you know, let's say they legalize marijuana tomorrow. Um, I can imagine the First Lady, uh, Michelle Obama, telling the President, <clears throat> you know what, Americans are too fat, and we have to blame those darn Mexican cookies for that. Uh, so let's let's ban Mexican cookies, and I can see the cartels calling each other and say, "Well, you know what? Marijuana is legal now. Let's smuggle cookies into the United States, 
and you would you know you could have the same problem i'm not again i'm not trying to be funny but no, i'm no, trying no, to no, illustrate no, the right. point that it it mexico's rule of law is so weak that 95 percent of all crimes are are not uh, there's no convictions there might be you know there may be some kind of investigation but you never really convict people wow. uh so that's the big reason why a lot of young people go into this trade and it's uh it, it pays it pays to be a criminal right. you may not live long but you can make some quick money and i think until mexico is able to to strengthen his rule of law you you're going to have a lot of the mayhem we we see today you've said in an interview that um, that the problem is the press uh, which is more than ever operating in zones of deeper silence when it comes to the drug war and it's its various webs of, of official corruption. Uh, is it true then that that the terror tactics against journalists are working deeply into into the organizations of the major media? I, I don't know that that I would say that it's the problem is the press uh, or that I, that I would blame the press. I <clears throat> I was born in Mexico, um, but I'm lucky that uh, over the years I I gained my U.S. citizenship. And it gives me a passport, a U.S. passport, that offers me protection that a lot of my colleagues in Mexico do not have. Yeah. <clears throat> People say I, I'm courageous and so forth. You know, I don't think I'm any more courageous than my colleagues in Mexico. Uh, but I'm lucky that I can work at a at an American paper, that I can carry my passport, that I can carry my my ID. I mean, I I may be American, but I look Mexican, right? Yeah, yeah. But at any time, I think I think if if uh, criminals look at me as a possible target, I, I hope they think twice, yeah. um, because my colleagues that. don't have that uh, that same right. They don't have that same protection, and so what's worrisome uh, uh, about the, um, the press in Mexico today, it's not just who you know that they're targeting certain people, but but the regions are targeting. You know, northern regions, for example, Chihuahua, for example, Tamaulipas. Uh, Coahuila, Nuevo León, uh, these are regions that, um, you know, you have more progressive societies. And yet you talk to, I mean, I talk to a lot of my colleagues and, and many of them are being forced to self-censor themselves, you know, because of, of the threats from organized crime, because of, uh, it, it depends on numbers. Some people say more than 40 people have been killed. Others say more than 100 people have been killed or disappear. So that sends a, a very blatant message to a reporter. Uh, if you don't have your government protecting you, and oftentimes uh, the, the drug war is really a war within the government itself. You know, it's so much corruption, so much corruption, that as a press member, as a reporter, who do you trust? Yeah. You know, who do you trust? Yeah, my God. And so oftentimes the best um, solution is either to, to uh, give in to the silence or to run to the United States. There's been cases of you know people seeking asylum, uh, reporters seeking asylum, and so that those are two troubling trends yeah. in a country that wants to modernize and wants to you know transition into something else. Right. I think any society needs a strong, viable, uh, vibrant press, and in Mexico, oftentimes it's hit or miss. I mean, there's some great journalism that's being practiced. Um, there's a new generation of journalists that, that's, uh, I mean, they're doing incredible work. But I, I also worry a lot more about my colleagues who, who can't do that, yeah. you know, who, who've been forced to uh, live in, in regions of silence and contribute to that silence. Yeah. This is sort of a personal question, but I know that, that um, as your book, uh, Midnight in Mexico Explores, you yourself have been threatened four times uh, with your life. What's it like? What's it like being a journalist under that, under that kind of pressure? You know, I I think, and and I'm I'm, I'm glad I'm talking because I mean you're 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 a journalist, but I think one of the things that I've learned um, from these threats is to embrace fear, because I think uh, fear is a it's a survival tool. It helps you you know, think about your life and it helps you appreciate your life and it helps you question the risks that you take. Um, 
I think anyone who covers organized crime, sooner or later you're going to get some kind of message or some kind of threat. In my case, uh, uh, there were there were three threats that I you know, I took seriously. I mean, I think you take every every threat seriously. But when a U.S. trusted source, someone who you've known for a long time, calls you up and says, "Hey, there's a there's a hit list, and there's uh, three names of uh, American journalists, and I think it's you," oh. I mean that you take very seriously. Oh my God! And I think I think in the beginning, you know, I was I was shocked. I mean, I think the first instinct is I gotta I gotta get out of here. I yeah. gotta I gotta leave for the United States. Uh, in my case, I I have family on both sides. And I felt like it was important for me to try to, first of all, investigate whether this was a reliable threat. Was it a, was it raw intelligence? I mean, what was it? And and I I spent some time in Mexico trying to figure that out. Um, I think eventually, like a lot of Mexicans, I especially the elite Mexicans, I ended up wanting to to flee Mexico and left. And it was really while I was away that I wanted to come back home. Yeah. I wanted to come back to Mexico, and I wanted to be able to try to find a way to explain what had happened to Mexico and why. I think oftentimes, you know, as as a as a Mexican American journalist, it's almost like a clash of beliefs and clash of culture and clash. In my case, you know, <clears throat> this all this idolism that I had at one point that quote, democracy was going to change Mexico. And like you, you you think, okay, what happened to this country? Why, how did I go wrong? And thinking, you know, back when I lived in El Paso and cover what to me felt like a, <clears throat> like a people's revolution right, right across the border in Ciudad Juarez. How, um, how, did, how did those initial steps go in the wrong direction? What happened? And I think that's, one of the reasons why I, I went back, you know, to try to figure this out and to try to to tell these stories of, of people. Because I, I oftentimes, I mean, you're you're running away, but you're also inspired by by the courage of of the people you cover. Yes. And 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 by the resilient uh, spirit, you know. That as a journalist I think means a lot. I mean in the end you know this all too well. Journalism is about passion. And I think that was my passion, and that continues to be my passion today. Did you write Midnight in Mexico in Mexico, or did you write it here? I tell you, you know, doing this tour, I, I've been asked a lot of questions, but that is one of the best questions. Um, because I, I think the key to me writing this book was to be on both sides of the border. And a lot of it was done out of uh, La Condesa, which is the neighborhood where I live in, in Mexico City. Um, a lot of it was done in El Paso, uh, which is where I, I officially call home right. these days. But I, I also, I think, had the benefit of distance. And I was able to uh, get a, a couple of fellowships, one in D.C. at the Woodrow Wilson Center and another one at, at Harvard as a Neiman Fellow. And as a David Rockefeller Latin American Center um, studies, and, and and so that that took me away. I think gave me enough distance to look at Mexico from all kinds of lenses, from far, from within, from right on the border, and in many ways, I think that was the key to trying to write a book where you explore the Mexico there and the Mexico here. And that theme, the Mexico here, the Mexico there, I'd like to explore a little bit uh, about some issues of immigration. Sure. Um, the AP here, as you know, uh, recently changed its policy in the use of the term illegal immigrant. And um, what do you think the role of language in North American media and politics is um, in its uh, basic de dehumanization of a huge segment of the American population? Uh, what are the effects of turning people into non-entities like that? I mean, I, you know, I think it it speaks a lot to to how far we have to go as as journalists, and it also speaks to the importance of diversity in the media, and and we're not there yet. Especially, I mean, I think there was a movement at one point, and then the economic crisis hit, and the and it hit the industry. Uh, I, for example, come from a. A, a bureau where we had 13 people 
on staff in, in Mexico City. At one point, I think we were the largest U.S. newspaper with the Bureau in Mexico. Um, and now we're down to one. Oh. And and so you have all these voices that are missing, that, that are not there. So I think oftentimes you see some of that insensitivity, insen like the use of the word alien, for example. I mean, again, you know, I was... I, I left Mexico as a six-year-old. I grew up in the San Joaquin Valley in, in California. And w one of the things that really drew me to journalism was being interviewed as a 13-year-old out in the fields. Uh, my, my parents worked for the United Farm Workers Union, you know, led by Cesar Chavez. And these guys came up, interviewed me, asked me, you know, what it's, what, what's it like to work out in the fields without water, without sanitation, et cetera. And that left a huge imprint in me. God, the man. fact that someone wanted to give me a voice. And I think that's really the challenge today for journalists, is, is the best way to get away from dehumanizing uh, people is to humanize them, to give them a voice, to tell their stories. And I think once that happens, you don't, you don't have to worry about the word illegal alien or illegal immigrant undocumented, they're human beings. What do you think then uh, um, are the major knowledge gaps for Americans in understanding the relationship between narco violence and, say, undocumented immigration? I, I think it's important for Americans to understand that whether it's drugs or whether it's, uh, it's work, in the end it comes down to U.S. demand. Uh, my father was a, a guest worker um, as part of the Bracero program. And he was in this country because there was a need for workers. I mean, they wanted... Uh, you know, I, I, my uncles always say, you know, the United States is a fickle country. They love you one moment and then they want to deport you and they want to get rid of you. Um, and I think Americans need to understand that uh, a lot of people have are, live here not because they, they want to or because they love to, but because it's a job. And oftentimes, if you talk to the relatives back home or if you talk to Mexicans on this side of the border, they like to be able to go back and forth or at least have that choice sure. of make a life in the United States or make a life in Mexico. One of the, I think, um, biggest advantages I had as a kid was knowing that my father would come home once a year. I did, as a kid, I didn't know I had a father because he was gone most of the time. But I knew that come you know, November, December, my father would leave California and stop on, you know, on his way to Durango, he would stop in El Paso and pick up some, uh, some Tony Lama boots. And he would show up, and to me, he was like my Santa Claus with the sombrero hat. So I, I, I knew that this man would come. I think today that if you go to you know, many parts of Mexico, that you, you, you find abandoned communities. And you find children or teenagers who don't know who their father is because of of these restrictions that have been set, you know, by the United States to to restrict the movement and circularity. So what you have, I mean, in, in the end what you have is instead of all these Mexicans in the Southwest in California, which was really uh, <clears throat> not the only home, but, but it, I mean, those predominantly, it was in that area. I mean, obviously, you have Chicago, you have other other areas, but uh, since then, you've, you've had this mass movement of people, who, you know, moving into places like uh, North Carolina, Atlanta, uh, I mean, the state of Georgia, Iowa, etc. And it's it it it, it backfires. I mean, it's uh, it's consequences that maybe the United States didn't want, but in, it ended up happening because of uh, of his policy. I know this is sort of a hard, hard thing to get at, but one gets the feeling that a lot of the narco violence is is young, carried out by young people. And, uh, is there a relationship uh, between this kind of abandonment? Are they easier prey for these drug armies? And uh, I mean, is this a kind of a children's war in a certain sense? I mean, I, I would, I would, uh, I would hate to generalize that sure. every. A young person or every poor person it becomes a narco in Mexico. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, <clears throat> they have dreams and they, and they do the right thing, and, and uh, many of them end up in the United States or end up finding a way to survive in, in Mexico. 
um, there's there's still you know there's a lot of I think dignity and integrity um, among a lot of young people I mean I I mean that's one of the, I think one of the perhaps best hopeful signs about Mexico right. is that a society it's I mean they still care very much about their country and, and care very much about their future but you know having said that there are also regions like for example in, in Sinaloa you know where um, as a reporter a few years ago I mean I was there and it just floored me you know this this saying that they have that uh, especially among young people I rather live five years as a king than 50 years as, as an ox you know and and so a lot of you know some people are lured by by the temptation of quick cash yeah. overnight you know you know where one day to the next you 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 can have a pickup truck and 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 it was interesting you know talking to some of them I said why not go to the United States I mean like like previous generations and the answer was it's too hard it's too difficult plus in the United States uh, they don't they don't want to, you know they don't want to say and that was really heartbreaking. I mean, that was really, oh, yeah. it was you know, a, a sea change in, in attitudes. And these people might not live long, but they feel like it's something that they can do, and it's something that's going to give their, their, them and their parents or families instant gratification. One of the saddest, I think, families I met was, <clears throat> uh, well, it was going to the cemetery and finding people who say, you know, my kid is now in into the drug trafficking business and one of the first things they do is they they uh they give their parents money say this is in case i'm killed i i i want to make sure that i buy a burial plot a Ooh. plot in the cemetery oh my God. and that was you know i mean that oh. gives you a sense of uh of the belief that they have oh. that this is instant money instant cash instant fame Thus, you have a lot of the corridos, you know, a lot of the music that uh, um, glorifies the, you know, who they think they are or who they think they, they, they want to be, you know, the, the, the next best kingpin. Some of the major underlying influences of narco violence and the narco phenomenon are long term economic instability, obviously, and uh, huge disparities in wealth uh, and wealth redistribution. As Mexico and the United States cope more and more with these issues. Uh, should Americans be paying more attention to what's going on in Mexico? They obviously should. But what should they be looking for? What, what are the indicators? What kinds of knowledge would be useful to us to understand what's actually happening on the ground in, your, in uh, our neighboring country? I mean, I think if you if, if you look at Mexico from a perspective of you know um, the last few months or the last maybe couple of years, the indicators are are pretty grim. But if if you look at Mexico from a twenty year perspective or from thirty years, which really you know when I started reporting, the indicators are positive. I mean, you look at you see signs that that things are happening, that that there is change underway. Um, transparency laws, for example. You you now have Mexican journalists who are <clears throat> testing these new transparency laws instituted uh, in the early two two thousand after the Vicente Fox election or after the the National Action Party opposition party took office, um, and so you you see people beginning to hold government accountable. One of the I think you know to, for me as a journalist one of the best times of the day is waking up waking up in the morning and you're reading newspapers and you're listening to to the radio uh, and I'm hearing I'm reading stuff that wasn't there back then you know what back when I arrived I mean, there were there was sure. there were a few isolated instances but you have people questioning officials the government you have government officials on the radio uh, actually defending themselves wow and that's healthy okay. I mean that's really healthy but I think the biggest indicator um, that that still the biggest challenge, or the, the most troubling sign, is the, the whole conviction rate. Ninety-five uh, percent. I mean, I keep saying that, but it's. I I think when. When more and more. When Mexico learns to punish its own people, I think that's when we're going to start think, thinking. Okay, Mexico is really, moving, forward. 
I think right now still, oftentimes I feel like we're we're stuck between dread and hope, hope and dread, wow. and and so that's something that I think has to really change. New Mexico Governor uh, Susana Martinez, in a recent national appearance, has said in regards to immigration that we must quote secure our borders first, and stress that the pathway to legal status for undocumented immigrants was to go to the back of the line. That's her quotation. Why is it that corporations that survive off of illegal, if you will, um, immigrant labor and the economic sectors in this country that depend on it, why are they always left out of the discussion? I love my profession as a journalist, and I, I plan to continue being a journalist for many, many years. So it's always hard to you know kind of give your opinion. But I, I think sometimes that uh, I always go back to again my uncles when they talk about the fickle country. Uh -huh. They love us one moment and then they they hate us and they want to deport us the next. Um, and, I, and I always think about that, you know, it, it, uh, the demand. Uh, when times are, are right or they're great in the United States, when there's prosperity, there are people creating jobs. I mean, why did we see so many Mexicans in the 1990s, you know, during the Clinton administration? It was a boom. I mean, it was a boom in the economy. And you had people just leaving in mass and no one seemed to mind no one seemed to care and sometimes i i it's not just politicians but the people in general i i kind of questions a question at times how do they really believe that a fence can separate us from them and who are them and who are we uh and and that's something that you know when i when i drive that u.s mexico border I often think of that. You know, you see the border patrol uh, helicopters, you see the vans, you see the the fans, and it's 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 more of a, I think of an emotional reaction because I am them and I am us. And how do you separate us from them? Like you, I have a deep love for Mexico. I've spent a lot of my adolescence in Mexico City. Um, it has to be true that this terrible war will end one day and that uh, the country will be released from its terrible death grip. If you had to speculate, um, how will this come about? What will cause the end of it? I, <clears throat> I really struggle with that, with that question because I... Um, I once thought I knew uh -huh. that you know democracy was going to transform Mexico and and things were going to just kind of change, and and I think we I mean we have seen a lot of change, but I think I've come to, to peace with myself that maybe the changes that I want to see and a lot of Mexicans want to see may not happen during my lifetime, uh -huh. but I think they're they're happening. I mean I think they're it's a slow evolving process, and. As many people keep telling me, you know, it's going to take years. I think, again, we go back to the science. Um, the United States has organized crime. I mean, there's, there's, it always shocks me when I come to this country and people say, oh, my God, are they here? I mean, it, this is a billion, billion dollar industry. You know, people say six, eight billion. Other people say 40 billion. Of course they're here. Yeah. But, but different ro rules, different forms apply. Uh, you're not... I don't think we're going to see um, heads rolling on I-25, I you know, like, like we have seen in, in Tamaulipas and, and Chihuahua and other places, because there's, you know, there's a rule of law in this country. There are laws that, uh, no matter how imperfect they may be, it, but it, I think it shows that the system works. Recently, I, I covered the, uh, a trial of a paramilitary group, uh, it was a CETAS organization in, in Austin, Texas, it was a horse racing trial. And it was interesting that, you know, as a reporter, you, 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 you cover this stuff in Mexico, and oftentimes you feel like you're chasing ghosts. Oh. And suddenly I'm at a, I'm in a U.S. courthouse, and there are names, and there are addresses, and there are faces. And you think, wow. And, and, you, and you begin to understand the importance of living in a country with laws and rules, and you think, that's Mexico one day. That's going to happen in Mexico someday. My lifetime, I'm not so sure. But I think that's where Mexico is headed.
Thank you so very, very much for being here with us today. It's been just a wonderfully informative and enlightening experience. We, had, we in the library at the New Mexico Mercury are really grateful to have you here. It was really my pleasure, and I, uh, I mean, I, I live in El Paso, and I feel like we're, we're, we have a lot more in common with New Mexico than we do with the rest of Texas. But also being here, you know, it just kind of, it really inspires me to want to just stay here and take over your house and, uh, <laughs> and your library <laughs> and, and maybe, and just uh, hold up here for another year or two and write another book. So thank you. It's been a delight. And thank you, and thank you Benito. Thank you so much.